Okay, our speaker today is uh, Toshiko Ichie, and uh, she got her uh, Bachelor of Arts in, uh, at Rice University, a PhD in Biophysics at Harvard University. She spent some time as a uh, postdoc at uh, uh, Berkeley. Uh, in 1989, she became assistant professor at uh, Washington State University, then associate pro and then full professor. And uh, 2003, uh, she became the uh, William G. McGowan Professor of Chemistry at Georgetown University. Uh, please help me welcome to Chico. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, chance to speak here. Um, I am from Georgetown University. I'm from the Department of Chemistry, uh, but I actually I have no degrees in chemistry. My BA from uh, Rice was in physics, and then I have a PhD in biophysics. So, um, but somehow I ended up in the chemistry department. <laughs> And so... I'm a uh, chemist and I ended up in the physics department. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, mean, I, I think that's one of the things that's wonderful these days is that everybody's sort of crossing disciplines. Okay, so um, as you all probably know, life has been found at amazing extreme flood conditions. Um, and so um, what we call organisms that live under extreme conditions. Um, the term is extremophiles. Um, and so, for example, um, there's been life found in the bottom of the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest sea trench. Um, and these are actually, um, this is a, like a lander kind of thing. And these are these fish. Um, the Mariana Trench is, uh, at the deepest point, is 11 kilometers, is about two degrees Celsius. And um, there is a translation, so uh, an atmosphere is approximately a bar, 0.1 megapascal. And in the ocean, um, every 10 meters of depth below the surface corresponds to a bar of pressure. So that's why we say it's about 1.1 um, kilobar. Um, and since we found life um, under these pressures, yes? When was this picture taken? Do you know when this campaign was? Uh, no. It must be relatively recent. So yeah. Um, the last couple of years or something. Yeah, the, uh, unfortunately, this one, I realize, is not a. Are those fish like the, creatures, or what are they? They're fishes. It's a uh, what? It's. I think they're called angelfish or something yeah, like yeah. that. Um, and um, so they found these things, fish. I have another picture somewhere of some little antipods. That's another common thing you see. Um, and actually, what we've been studying a lot of is just microbes from these depths. Um, but they actually have found it in the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, uh, which of course, uh, life at the deepest part. Uh, which corresponds to a pressure of about 1.1 kilobar. So you, at least right now, um, that may be a maximum of pressure that things can grow at. Um, there also has been um, life found in hydrothermal vents. Um, this is a picture of a hydrothermal vent that's in the ocean, and it's 7.5 kilometers but, uh, below the surface. And um, they have actually cultured bacteria that has a maximum, um, uh, what they call the maximum optimal growth temperature of 122 degrees Celsius. So this is 22 degrees Celsius above boiling, which is kind of amazing. And so you might say, well, maybe, like, as far as we know so far, is the maximum growth temperature might be 122 degrees Celsius. But that's just based on when we found life. We don't actually know what is the limit that you could push these things to. So why are we interested? So why study life under extremes? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Um, one of the thing, reasons is it's thought that life originated on this planet um, under high temperature, high pressure. And so there's a lot of questions in terms of you know, what was 
early life like, and that understanding these organisms may help us understand early life. Of course, we're also looking for extraterrestrial life. This is the moon of Saturn, I believe. Uh, so there's, um, whether we're looking uh, within our solar system, it seems like it's probably, if we find it within our solar system, it will be on moons, or, uh, you know, these days, they are, people are finding these planets that seem to be within the range of what we might call habitable. Um, and uh, this is a <laughs> this is my shark. So I, I was giving a talk down in um, Rio de Janeiro this summer, and it turns out that um, they're having a lot of shark attacks recently in the beaches off of Rio. And what is happening is is these sharks are coming they're coming in from what used to be the deep ocean side of a trench outside of uh, those beaches to the shallow water. And so with climate change, we might be having organisms coming from different kinds of extreme environments into what we would consider our normal environment. So it's worthwhile understanding that. You were talking a few minutes ago about like at the bottom of the ocean, Mary Alistair, you talk sharks are deep, but you don't have sharks down at, at the bottom of no. the ocean? No, I think the maximum depth of sharks is about 3,000 meters. Really? Yeah, there are some... What's, what's down there for them to attract them? Down well, you know, some of them actually go up and down, but there's, like, there's... Uh, yeah, there's a question about swim bladder for to get an equilibrium or something like that. So, for one thing, I will admit, I am not a biologist. <laughs> so I don't know about, the, you know, the biology of these things, but I, um, a friend of mine is one of these guys who actually goes out and ca catches sharks and... And the, the sharks and rays actually go into these deep water. Um, yes? Because I knew the people that took the, the fish picture, the fish were only found up to a depth of 9,000. Okay. And if you go to the Mariana trenches, you only see some crustaceans. The yeah, oh, okay. So I have a crustacean picture, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you because yeah, you're I, I know the guys. They're, they're kind of tiny. Um, so that is from a trench, but it's not from the bottom of the Mariana Trench. There are some um, crustaceans that they or anth anthropods or whatever they're called, mm, arthropods. Um, and arthropods. And there are um, yeah, I'm not a biologist. Um, they have found um, uh, bacteria, and that's mostly what you can see. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll show you some of the depths where there are sharks uh, And another, another thing, I, I, when I say, well, you should actually understand death under extinction. So what does it take to actually kill something? Because um, from a practical point of view, um, a lot of preservation, food preservation and also sterilization techniques are based on high temperature, high pressure, and you want to make sure you actually kill the bugs. So pasteurization, um, it's, it actually is, is at a temperature that's below 100 degrees Celsius. That might say that the, hopefully everything that's uh, nasty in milk is, uh, has a maximum survival temperature of 1,000, uh, 100 degrees Celsius, but we actually do know that you know, we, things can be cultured at 122 degrees Celsius, so we, we have to worry about these things. Um, another reason that you might uh, want to understand what kills uh, life um, is there's a process which I like to call, what a lot of people call pascalization after Pascal, is high pressure food processing. And it, the, what they do is they take food and it put it under pressures of six to eight kilobar with the hopes of killing the microbes in it. And actually, the reason why I have this picture pulling guacamole up there is that um, if you buy, uh, if you notice these days, you can actually buy guacamole in a sealed package and it'll last for two weeks. If you, if you ever made it at home, it only lasts like a day without turning ground. And the reason why it works is because it's high pressure food processed or pascalized. There's a lot of fruit juices that are done this way that are on the market. 
Uh, and this is obviously on the market. They used to require special labeling, but they don't anymore. Oh, um, their uh, preserved meats, deli meats, are done with high pressure food process. And so you really want to make sure you're killing things. Um, and um, so, you know, like right now, they're using pressures of uh, less than eight kilobar. Um, and they seem to be killing a lot of stuff. But there's evidence, actually, that, that um, there are some disease-producing microbes that, it, that can survive over a gigapascal with the pressure. Mm -hmm. So this is um, of concern. OK. So my premise is for organisms to live in it, an extreme, and when I say live, I mean actually live and grow and reproduce, um, their macromolecules inside of them that they're made up of have to work under the extreme condition. So if you have, the, uh, if, whether it's a microbe or a multicellular organism, the cells are all made up of the same components. They have nucleic acids, they have uh, proteins, and they have a cell membrane. And so those things have to work under that, whatever the extremes are. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, it turns out that DNA is very robust. And so it's really not sensitive to, to those things. The two things that to, to extreme, so I'm going to actually focus on extremes of pressure and temperature. Extremes of pressure and temperature, uh, DNA is pretty robust. And the things that are most sensitive seem to be the membranes and the proteins. So the membranes help define inside from outside in a living cell. I'm not a membrane specialist, so that's why we don't particularly look at them. Other people do. Um, the other thing is um, the proteins. So in order, proteins are the things that make your cells work. They perform all the functions. They're the functional things. They, they're enzymes, they're structural things, um, and so they have to work as well. They can't be destroyed by these pressures or temperatures. And so what this ends up being is that we're talking about everything from biology, things that biologists study, cells, to things that chemists and physicists may study, like molecules. And this is a schematic, this is a drawing of dihydrofolate reductase, which is not really important. Um, what it is, it's, a, it's an enzyme, um, and it's found ubiquitously, so that means like every organism has a, um, this uh, enzyme. And so we happen to have been studying it a lot. And um, what, um, what has been done is there's a lot of work that's been done in, in terms of the biology, trying to find these extremophiles. There's some work being done to understand, trying to understand the molecules and what they're doing. And uh, what I'd like to say is that computational methods can help provide a link um, and so we are, our group is, mainly does computations. Um, we've actually started a bit, I have one student now who's doing some uh, experiments at NIST, actually, half of the time. So uh, I have just one little result from him. But um, we, we hope to provide a link. And also, you know, the thing about the types of calculations we do we do what are called molecular dynamic simulations, which is basically, you know, you take your molecule, actually if it's a protein, you put it in water because that's where proteins usually work, and you just simulate it. And in, in a computer simulation, we use Newton's equations of motion, very basic physics, and we just solve it over and over again to try and understand how um, the mole molecules are behaving in response to different conditions. And we can do it at different different pressures, um, and in some ways the fact that, um, well, in a, not quite this simple, but in a computer simulation you can set T equals to 300 Kelvin, P is equal to one kilobar, and it goes. But the thing that 
Um, I'm going to actually talk mostly about pressure, uh, some, something about temperature. And the reason why is that temperature is something that we've been able to control in the lab for a long time. Everybody has an experience in terms of, oh, you know, heating something up with a Bunsen burner or dumping it in an ice bucket. We all have experience with that. But most of us do not have experience with a diamond anvil cell. That it's hard to generate pressure. And we're talking about, you know, pretty high pressures that you can't just generate um, normally in the lab. But these days, there is more and more um, equipment that has been developed to study things under pressure. And so, um, and also to find organisms that are, un that have grown under high pressure. So there's just been this, um, maybe in the past, like less than 10 years, more that's being understood about these organisms and finding these organisms and also um, the instrumentation that's been developed to study them in the lab. So that's why um, it's sort of timely. And there is this thing that, um, I, I, I've actually been doing this maybe high pressure stuff maybe three, four years, but high pressure is not like high temperature. So your intuition that you build up from your Bunsen burner and your ice bucket, pressure does different things. It, so, you know, like temp, if you use like Gibbs free energy, um, you have a T delta S, which is, um, uh, tells you what happens when you change, temp change temperature. But what controls the pressure is P delta V, so it's a change in volume. So think, it's, it's not an entropy thing, it's a volume thing. Okay, so um, our overall goal is we're trying to understand what are the maximum pressure, temperature, and X stands for chemical composition. And so we're trying to understand what are the maximums that protein can function at. Um, I have P in red because I've been focusing mostly on pressure, but because of the biology of what we have. So most of the organisms that we have are actually from the cold deep ocean. So it's, it's like four degrees Celsius and high pressure. Uh, except for those near the hydrothermal vents, which are, of course, very high. But um, the, one, the ones that we have the most inf information are cold temperatures. So when you compare to something like, uh, like us, so our body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius. So there are things, so you're not really ca comparing apples to apples if you compare something from one uh, that, that's as far as that atmospheric pressure from the bottom of the ocean because there's also a temperature change. And our focus, and perhaps maybe why I'm speaking to you, is that we're actually sort of interested more in the material properties of these proteins. Because there are some properties of protein that, oh, you know, it's like, oh, this active site has this residue which does this. But there's also just, for the protein itself, to function, it has to, it's like just any material. If, if, if you want it to function at a high pressure, under normal pressure, it's gonna, you're gonna ask different things about the material. And so we're interested in what are those material differences. Um, some more introduction. So um, when we think about what makes an enzyme work, we, like, um, there are, it's pretty clear that an enzyme has to be folded into its proper 3D structure. So it has to be stable in that structure. And so you have to have folded proteins. But what um, people sometimes forget about in my field is something I learned back when I was a graduate student that it's not just the structure of the protein that's important, but it also has to be flexible enough because pro enzymes, when they go through their function, they change shape. So if you had an 
absolutely hard as a rock, stable enzyme, it wouldn't work. But how stable it is and how flexible it is is really going to depend on the pressure and the temperature you have the material at. And, and you know, we all know this. This is the different materials, if you put them under different pressure and temperature, they're going to behave differently. And so this is a, a, a diagram. It's actually a PT diagram of um, the stability of a protein. So a s protein is stable in this, uh, inside the circle, but it actually, so if you get, increase the temperature, it becomes un uh, destabilized. It also becomes destabilized if you take it down to cold enough temperatures. It, um, and if you go to high pressures, it also unfolds. Proteins are very weird. Um, and, but this is just like, like I said, just about the stability. But there's also the range of pressure and temperature you can be at of which they're active. And so you have also have, this may not, is not the same thing because things that drive things to be more stable tend to make them less flexible. And so you need to have this balance, stable, but flexible. Okay, like I said, um, I'm um, mostly interested in pressure effects of proteins. So what does pressure do to proteins? Well. As you can imagine, if you just put hydrostatic pressure on a protein, it's going to compress it. That sounds logical. Um, but high enough pressures, and it depends on the pressure, or it depends on the protein, but under high enough pressures, pressure actually unfolds a protein. Um, this has actually been pretty well established these days, but it was quite puzzling to understand how it does this. But um, I wonder if pressure unfolding the protein, if they're in, how do you say, an aqueous solution, if the pressure essentially just sort of pushes the water in and unfolds it. Yeah, so that, um, I would phrase it a little differently. I wouldn't say that pressure pushes um, water in because water, I mean, pressure pushes on everything. So the protein is being compressed and the water is being compressed. But um, as one of my experimentalist friends keeps on telling me, is that pressure unfolding is actually different than thermal unfolding. And what it is, is that the pressure unfolded protein is the lowest thermodynamic state. And why is it the lowest thermodynamic state? It's because basically, if you think of a protein that's all folded up, there are gaps in it because it's, it's a single chain, a few chains, and so there are cavities. If you unfold it, you can allow water to pack up against the chain much more tightly than you can pack polypeptide against polypeptide. So the lowest volume state is the unfolded protein, just because water is a small molecule and it packs up against the chain more closely. But it's, it's sort of a not quite the right idea that pressure pushes water in, it just that that in the end is the lowest thermodynamically phased state. But when we think about this in terms of this question of stability versus um, flexibility, well, you know, okay, so we can understand something about, well, you can't unfold the protein, but when we think about flexibility, and this is also one of the things, flexibility is sort of a hard thing to measure. You can measure <coughs> the stability of the protein by seeing if it forms a nat native structure, and you, but it's very hard to quantitate flexibility. But if you think of your, your pressing on a protein, you're doing two things. If you compress on something, usually you decrease the flexibility. But if you unfold it, that makes it a lot more flexible. So it seems like there are some competing effects when you're dealing with um, pressure effects on proteins. Okay, a little bit of biology. 
So um, I'm going to try and uh, get to two, hopefully two questions. Um, and the first one is really, how do enzymes from extremophiles adapt to pressure and temperature? So there's uh, been work uh, that's pretty established by uh, the 2000 about um, um, some of the effects that happen when you look at proteins from uh, different extremophiles. So a cyclophile in blue is something that lives in very cold temperature. A mesophile in black here is normal temperatures. And a thermophile is something that lives in hot temperatures. And this over here, it's a little hard to see, but this is the enzyme activity. And if you look at the enzyme activity, this what, is a, what is it actually meant by activity? Good question. <laughs> you know, it, it means different things that, for different pro, pro enzymes, but it's just making, being able to make product. Okay. You know, so whatever the enzyme reaction so, that so, the enzyme sort of a catalogs. reactivity type of thing. Yeah. So if you look at the enzyme activity of a thermophile, it uh, tends to be much higher. The maximum activity occurs at a higher temperature than a mesophile, than a psychrophile. Um, that's not uh, unsurprising. Um, and if you look at, so this right here, this delta G is the difference between the folded state and the unfolded state. So it crosses, when it crosses zero, it unfolds, when it becomes negative. So this temperature is higher for the thermophile than the mesophile than the psychrophile. Again, this makes sense because you don't want your thermophile protein to unfold at the temperature it's at. But there is a question. Okay. So, so those are three different enzymes. Yeah. Okay. These are all. But they are so it's, it's actually this basically the same enzyme, but three different organisms that. It, so no, no, no. Is it, so is the molecule the same, or has it been modified? No, not modified. Oh, but it is different. Um, slight sequence. So proteins are usually around 100 residues long, you know, like a polymeric unit long. And they're not exactly identical from organism to organism. They're not even exactly identical between you and you. There are mutations, but they fold into the same three-dimensional structure and have the same um, function. So they perform, this is beta amylase, which is, I think it does something to sugar. Yes. And it's the same beta amylase, if you, if, I'll show you a superposition of two molecules, but you know, if you superimpose them on top of each other, you'd just be hard pressed to tell the difference between them. But there are slight different chemical differences between them. This is what I ask you, is, is this a reflection of the molecular shape? The difference is molecular shape or is it the same is the environmental? No, so these were all tested under the same conditions. Okay. Fine. So it's not the environment. So these were all, I forget what this is, but sure. it's probably like 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere. Sure. So it's, it's um, it, so if you, and, and um, yeah, if you did these in the conditions where the um, organism lives, so if you, this, you know, lives, a, Below, you know, somewhere in 20, this was somewhere above 80 Celsius. If you put them all at the same, at, their, at the conditions where they grow, the curves almost exactly superimpose. And so that's why they spread out like this. And so, you know, but there is this thing that I, I was talking about the, the, the dichotomy between stability and flexibility. Because, you know, you could say, well, if you, the only thing you have to worry about is how stable the protein is. You could say, well, why not, why not make the cyclophile protein um, stay stable up to a high temperature because it doesn't matter. Um, but there's always a drop off on the other end. And what they, so the, what they think for what for pretty much have shown the drop off in activity at the high temperature end is because the protein starts to unfold. The reason it drops off at the low temperature end 
is because of flexibility. So a thermophile protein, um, to be very stable, it's not very flexible at cold temperatures. And so this cyberphile protein, this cold living guy, it needs to be flexible enough to work at cold temperatures. So is it, but, and how does it do it? It does it by becoming less stable. Because if it's less, so if you, the way that proteins work to increase their stability is they get more interactions like hydrogen bonds, for instance. You put more hydrogen bonds, the more rigid you make the thing, the more stable it is. But you also then make it less flexible. And so, and the, the reason why they say this is that if you look at these free energy of unfolding, um, so that uh, this cyberphile is much less uh, stable to unfolding than the thermophile is. But there's another kind of curious thing that comes um, from, uh, that, from this diagram. So this thing actually turns over. There's a and, you know, and so what this is, is actually where this turns over, this is this phenomena I call cold unfolding. Because proteins do two things. Well, yes, they all unfold under high temperature, but they also unfold under low temperature. But you will notice this is zero degrees Celsius. So obviously they haven't observed this for a lot of things because uh, you would have to put the protein under low temperatures and keep the water fluid. So, but this is um, based on the thermodynamic parameters of what H and S are. You have this phenomenon of low temperature unfolding. But the thing that is... If, if the low folding has a uh, lower entropy, then, then the unfolding must be driven by the energy change. Exactly. And so um, the thing that, though, that is unusual here is that while the thermophile has higher um, melting temperature, you might expect the cyberphile, the cold guy, to be stable to lower temperatures, right? Because it's a cyberphile. But actually, this says that the cyberphile is just barely stable, where the thermophile is going to be stable way down to much lower temperatures. So why is that? OK, this is biology. This is, <laughs> this, is what it, this is what evolution has picked. It's not picking what, you know, the thing that we would think is logical. It's picking out what it thinks is logical. What works best. What works best? And the thing is, is, you know, there are not too many organisms that have to go very far below zero degrees Celsius. I had some super cooling, but not, you know, 20 degrees below Celsius. And so the fact that this, this protein um, is stable down, you know, to a few degrees below Celsius, it's not an evolutionary driving pressure to be stable all the way down to minus 100 degrees Celsius. It doesn't care because water's frozen by that point. So it's, it's an evolutionary driving pressure. It's what works. And for this guy, what's happened is that in order to be um, flexible, it needs to be less stable, which means that it has fewer hydrogen bonds but being less stable to high temperature, uh, to temperature also means you're less stable, period, to also to cold and cold. That's why this goes up much higher, this goes up is much lower. Okay, so this is background on, on uh, growth temperature. And there, there was sort of this idea that, that, the, um, that if you um, look at an enzyme at the growth conditions of the organism that it came from, 
It's going to look alike, and that's why you have this spread. There's a um, more recently, people have actually started looking at um, enzymes from mesophiles and piezophiles, and piezophiles being things that live under high pressure. And this is actually for another protein, DHFR, which happens to be the one that we're looking at. And these are all these are all experimental data, not our data. It's data we're trying to understand. And so, in this particular case, there's a DHFR, the hydrofolate reductase. It's a case of course, a protein that, uh, enzyme that uh, changes, oh, it reduces the hydrofolate. And so if you look at the mesophile, as you, this is increasing pressure from 0 to 2.5 kilobar. It decreases. OK, that seems to make sense. The piezophile, the activity increases, but then it starts to decrease as high pressures. Again, it has this funny, so we were trying to understand this curve. And again, there's this sort of funny um, change where, much like in a sacrophile case, it's kind of strange in that if you look at the mesophile, it unfolds, this is zero, it unfolds at above 2.5 kilobar. But the piezophile, the guy who's supposed to like high pressure, um, unfolds at about 0.7 kilobar. So it's like, again, you would think it should be pressure stable, but it's not. And, um, and actually, it's where this turns over corresponds to it melting. So it, it's state, and this thing actually, this particular piezophile lives at about um, 0.2 kilobar. No, so meso it doesn't mean mid doesn't it? What? Meso means mid doesn't it? Sorry, meso means normal. Normal. No, so normal. normal temperature pressure. <coughs> so this this mesophile is E. coli. So E. coli is obviously about one atmosphere, and its optimal temperature is about 37 about body temperature, optimal growth temperature. So it you know so that this for this piezophile. Being stable against pressure unfolding doesn't seem to matter because it likes to live at about 0.2 kilobar. And so the fact that it starts becoming less active above 0.5 kilobar doesn't matter. It's what works. Um, and so these were un unfolding curves from calorimetric measurements. I said that we're doing some experiments as well. Um, so we've been doing some small angle neutron scattering up at NIST. Um, and this is work that my graduate student, Ryan, has been doing with uh, Susanna Murugut Tahir. And um, so this is a measurement of the radius of gyration of the protein versus pressure. And um, up to 1.5 kilobar, this one from the mesophile E. coli is, um, is staying compact. Whereas the one um, from this piezophile, Moritella, it's called Moritella profunda. I call it MP just for simplicity. And I will try and use, I use this code through the rest of it. The piezophile is always in blue, and the mesophile is in green. So you see unfolding under pressure. So this is, um, and this is something that, we're, we're working with it, uh, the NIST people to develop some more um, of these scattering experiments where we can actually ask these questions. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we've done. So all of this was, a lot of it was background. I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we've done, but I will really try and tell you highlights um, just to sort of say some of the things that we're looking at. Because we're, you know, we've, got, we've been doing these simulations, and so we've been doing these molecular dynamics computer simulations, and we've been looking at the hydrofolate reductase. And this is a superposition of the crystallographic structures of these two molecules. And, and this is like, um, this is a representation that biochemists like to use where it's just basically a ribbon diagram along the polypeptide backbone without putting in all the side chains. 
Um, and there's some uh, sort of conventions where things like this correspond to an alpha helix. These arrows correspond to beta sheets. But basically, um, there's the cyclophile in blue, and there's a um, mesophile in green. And this, basically, you see arrows where you see arrow in both helices or in the same places. Uh, so things are just, um, wouldn't be considered obvious structural differences. Um, so this one, this slide's a little complicated, but so one of the things that we decided to look at was just like how trying to quantitate flexibility. So we just asked, what is the root mean square fluctuation of the of the all of the atoms in the protein from their average position? So it just is a measure of like how flexible it is. And um, so we did this MPDHFR, the enzyme from the sacrophile, enzyme from the mesophile. We did it at a bunch of different temperatures and two different pressures. And so um, you, you actually have to look at these things on a long enough time scale. So um, in terms of the way proteins work, proteins, you know, they, they have a certain amount of just atomic fluctuation, but they also have more collective type motions. And it's in, where you see the differences in the, is in the collective motions. So for one thing, this blue line here, these, this is Mortatella. So you just, one thing is, it's always higher, regardless of the temperature or the pressure, it's always higher than from the mesophile. So it's more flexible, because the fluctuations are um, larger. Um, fluctuations also increase with temperature. That's uh, just because temperature increases dynamics. And um, the thing that we thought was kind of, we weren't quite sure what was gonna happen, is the solid line is at one bar and the dashed line is at 220 bar. And the reason we picked 220 bar is that's where the mesophile lives at, that depth. So it's, the fluctuations are actually bigger under high pressure. We weren't quite sure because pressure does two things to a protein. It compacts it, but also unfolds it. But even on this time scale, you know, this is a couple of nanoseconds, a 10 nanosecond um, time scale, they, the pressure is increasing it. Um, and so we wanted to understand why, at, even at, the, so when you get up to over two kilobar, you start unfolding. But we're talking about 220 bar. So what's happening at this time? Um, pressure that's causing this to um, fluctuate more. Um, and um, I guess the other thing I wanted to point out is that MP, DHFR, it's got a growth temperature and pressure of 279, 220 bar, uh, E. coli, 310, one bar, and the fluctuations are about the same. So they, it's a sort of a um, similarity. Um, I won't go into this too much, because um, it, it is getting long. But I just wanted to, so one of the things is that, um, so we're, I said we're interested in material properties, but we're talking about these proteins. So how do you measure material properties of a protein? Experimentally, it's very hard because they're very tiny bodies and material properties are more like gross properties. And so we, because that we, you know, we have this simulation, we can just say, okay, what are these average properties? And we analyze them basically, you know, in terms of a force constant, and if we can get a force constant, we can get things like the thermal expansivity and the compressibility. So we were trying to characterize find a way to characterize uh, proteins in, in terms of this. Um, and I, yeah? When you say force constant, I mean, is a spring constant? So, yes. <laughs> you know, force constant like a spring. So the, basically, the idea that we just did is we assume that every single atom in the protein has a local pro 
harmonic well. And we just said, on average, if we have a certain size atomic fluctuation at a certain temperature, that corresponds to a certain correspond force constant for a harmonic well. And that's what I mean by that force constant. And so then, then we, if we can ca characterize that average, we can you know, take derivatives and whatever and get you know, quantities. And, and so sort of the upshot of by doing this we were able, you know, so we could, um, if we think of, the, you know, that, that there's a, an atom that's just uh, fluctuating in the field of all the rest of the, um, this is sort of like an Einstein oscillator picture, is it's fluctuating in the potential well created by all the surrounding atoms. Um, so, if that's the case, if you increase the temperature, the well gets wider. The other thing that happens is that if you have these collective motions, which is can say hopping between wells, so collective motion is something that's larger. What temperature can do is it will increase. If you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy to get over the barrier. But what happens when you have pressure? Well, pressure decreases the width of the local wells because everything's getting closer together. But from our analysis, based on this thing, is the transitions get easier. And the thing is, is that it seems to be lowering the barrier. But the question was, yeah, we say it's lowering the barrier, but we weren't sure why it's lowering the barrier. And so, Again, I, you know, I'm going to skip to sort of tell you the message, is that what seems to be happening is that pressure is breaking the hydrogen bonds between the atoms in the protein. Now, you might ask, why is it, why is it breaking it? So if you have, it, it, it does depend. It's not every single one. Pressure, in some ways, should increase the strength of a hydrogen bond just by pushing the two, the donor and acceptor, close together. But when they've gotten as close as they can get together, it also torques them. So as you increase pressure, you also, so a, a perfect hydrogen bond is linear, donor, hydrogen, acceptor. But pressure also will tend, to, just because you make less room for things to happen, you also tend to torque them. And that is what seems to be happening um, that's causing these hydrogen bonds to break. Um, just a little bit of biology. So there's, there is a specific hydrogen bond between this one, one, residue 113 and residue 27. Um, and if we look at the lifetime of the hydrogen bond in the E. coli, the mesophile, it's the, the length of the hydrogen bond, uh, lifetime is 25 nanoseconds. In MPDHR, it's 48 picoseconds. It's like three orders of magnitude uh, different. Why is it different? Well, so the donor is a threonine and a I don't, don't have to know what these are. But the, accept, <coughs> the acceptor is an aspartic acid in this one and a uh, glutamic acid in this. What's the difference? Well, aspartic acid, uh, so this is, the side chain is a carbon and then a carboxylic group. Uh, Moritella profunda, it's like two carbons in a carboxylic group. Most people would think that's a null mutation, at least the biochemist, that shouldn't make a difference, or not much. But yet it makes a order of difference of three orders of magnitude in our simulations. And these were simulations, but they actually did this site-specific mutagenesis, where they took this guy, which had an aspartic acid, and they substituted in one glutamic acid, they substituted, so essentially this means you in this protein, which is, you know, like um, thousands of atoms, you add one more carbon, and what ends up happening
happening is, so it's, uh, if you remember the E. coli, it decreases in activity um, with pressure. You make that substitution and that's what happens here. It just goes up. So you add one more carbon and you make, um, make it become pressure tolerant. So that's sort of the biology of it. So this is the kind of thing that biologists really like to to try and understand. In, in the structure, what is this carbon, more or less? What is I'm it? sorry? So this is an aspartic acid. So no, it has I mean a, in, in the protein, per, where would it be? It's right here. Okay. So the, the hydrogen bond is between this threonine and this aspartic acid. So, and then over here, there's an extra carbon right here. Okay. Um, where, let's see, do I get to talk a lot about that? I'm not going to talk a lot about the biology, but, but actually the strength of that hydrogen bond seems to do a lot in terms of the correlation of what's going on because of it, it being a strong or weak bond, so it, it, but it totally changes the pressure sensitivity. Um, and so, you know, I said that the, what we were trying to do was understand this diagram, and so this is E. coli versus Moritella profunda. Um, so we think the rise, initial rise, is due to having this weaker, I mean, this is the thing, it's a weaker hydrogen bond, and then, this fall is due to the overall weaker hydrogen bonds, and so it's melting. Um, see, how am I doing a time? Oh. Okay, maybe I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, so, as, yes? To a simple-minded physicist, it seems that pressure pushes things closer together that even though the activation energy stays the same, the distance between the wells are, are now closer. So I'm not, I'm not entirely shocked that there's a factor of three orders of magnitude difference because you push the wells closer together because you have an exponential decay through the well and now you've shortened the length of the forbidden region. So. I, I would say quantum mechanical tunneling to this group. <laughs> I don't know if that's what's happening, but that because your because your your computational simulation is set up to capture these quantum mechanical tunneling. It's not. It's not. Okay. No. I'm surprised. Yeah. Well, it, because it's, it's all Newtonian. It's Newtonian. It's well, the word Newtonian. nature. Yeah. Okay. It just it's like force is equal to mass times acceleration, okay, <laughs> and we so just no, keep on solving that solving no, that over again. Well, that, that's kind of shocking. Then, that in a truly Newtonian situation, that you get three orders of magnitude difference by just huh. what does the nature of mean? Yeah, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the thing that you know is actually really complicating and frustrating about doing biology. If you've been a physicist before, is that you, you push one thing and. 50 other things change, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and you don't know what what is the effect, what is the direct effect, and what is not. Um, okay, so I will take advantage of the fact that we did start a little late. I just wanted to just introduce this thing as that, so we've been talking a lot about the proteins themselves, but something else that happens is there are other things that are in the intracellular environment that seem to <coughs> change protein stability under pressure. And so that's why they're, they're referred to as piezolites. They're sort of osmolites that these things have that seem to affect. <coughs> um, this, is, uh, this is the result of, uh, so people have actually, Paul Yancey, he's, he's been looking at these sharks and rays, these are like, he goes out and gets, catches these things and whacks off a hunk of muscle and then, you know, like, analyzes it. And so these sharks go down to depth of three kilometers, uh, which is 300 bar. Um, it ha the sharks and rays use this um, mixture of TMAO and urea as an osmolite. Um, urea actually happens to denature proteins, 
TMAO stabilizes proteins, and there's this magic ratio of two urea to one TMAO where they cancel out each other's effects. And at the surface, the sharks and rays have this ratio. So the presumption is they have this ratio because they don't want to, you know, the shark doesn't want to have its, all of its enzymes destabilized. The thing that gets interesting, so this is TMAO, well this is TMAO, this is TMAO concentration. This is a wet mess content. <laughs> um, the concentration of TMAO increases with depth while the concentration of urea decreases with depth. So, there was, people have been postulated that somehow or another this TMAO is acting as a piezolite. It's helping these sharks at ray, sharks and rays um, at these, this depth. And so we were interested in understanding why this happens. You know, how, how does the counteraction occur? And also, how does it act <coughs> as a piezolite? And I will just really try and whisk through this. So, so what we actually did was we looked at the diffusion. We d looked at just solutions. And with urea, TMAO mixtures. And so this is pure water, the diffusion of water Actually, pure water, so for those who know anything about water under pressure, diffusion of water under pressure is unusual because up to about a kilobar, it increases. But where is it diffusing to? Uh, Self-diffusion. Self-diffusion. If you just take, oh. label, you know, that <coughs> water and just <coughs> diffuse, it increases with pressure. Most fluids decrease with pressure. The, the diffusion rate, they move more slowly the more you... Water diffusion increases up to a kilobar and then it turns over and starts to decrease. And uh, <coughs> urea doesn't affect this diffusion rate. TMAO affects it a lot. Um, this is if you kept, keep a constant ratio of three to one, it increases. But if you actually, if you adjust the ratio of TMAO and urea to what it is in the sharks, it stays approximately constant, which is sort of indicating that maybe the sharks are trying to maintain a homeostasis of um, water diffusion. And we went through a bunch of analysis, which I'll just go hand way through, but we think this, this um, diffusion is controlled by hydrogen bond lifetimes. This, the hydrogen bond lifetimes say something about the strength of the hydrogen bonds and say something about solvating um, the unfolded protein. And so we think that this is actually an important aspect of how um, uh, these um, cartilaginous fish are maintaining the ability to be stable under um, pressure. Um, let me see, I'm just going to skip the model. But this is my last slide. Um, <coughs> I just wanted to point out, so what I was showing you was up to a kilobar. And um, so th these are simulated and experimental. So that uh, um, using different water models, it's not that important. You need to just look at this and this, which are experimental diffusion rates. So up to about a kilobar, this is at uh, 300 Kelvin, the diffusion goes up and then goes down. At 277, it goes up and it goes down. This has been known for, I don't know, 50 years or something more. Um, one of the interesting things is, is that at the maximum conditions um, where life has been found so far is at about 100 kilobar. And that is, you know, pretty much corresponding to this part where it's going uphill. Um, we have, uh, we have not so far found life where it's going on the downhill. Um, there is a real reason why that changes. So we've been doing some simulations. So 
Um, there are different ways of putting it, but basically water is four coordinated tetrahedral. And as you press on it, you get more and more interstitial water. So it becomes five coordinated, six coordinated, seven coordinated. And this, this really marks the point, we think, of where you go from being tetrahedral water. So water is actually fairly ice-like, and it's four, it, the average coordination number is four to five. Ice is four, so it's four to five. But when it really becomes more like five, it becomes more like, um, like a Leonard Jones fluid, like a simple fluid. And so that where it starts to turn over, lots of things happen. It starts to behave more like a simple liquid. It starts to behave, um, the fusion behaves normally. You, you get rid of a lot of the anomalous properties. And so it, there is a question, like how, how important is this for life? It's because it's saying something about the strength of the hydrogen bonds, which are important for protein structure. But also how you know that how water interacts with water is obviously important in many uh, catalytic events. Um, so for many reasons, and not just the stuff that that the protein floats in. So um, and as we look at life on other planets, where you really will have different conditions, does this make is this some sort of constraint in understanding life as we know it? I mean, of course you can have different kinds of life, but. Anyway, um, just wanted to conclude. Um, so for our first question, you know, looking at the uh, enzymes, is that the material properties are important? And that unlike high, um, high temperature, high pressure has many opposing effects. You know, temperature seems to just make everything bigger. Pressure makes something smaller, something bigger, and it increases something that so it's much, um, so for instance, like when you look at how uh, uh, temperature affects a protein, you can just say, oh, well, it just, um, it just makes all the fluctuations, all the motions bigger. But in a protein, it depends upon if you're in a crowded area of the protein where there's no cavities or if there's an area where there are cavities. So it's, it's much more dependent on the local structure. Whereas temperature is like, you know, it's KT, so it goes all over the place. And then I just also wanted to say is that, you know, that this thing with looking at the chiazolites, um, we also see that actually looking at these hydrogen bond lifetimes are actually just like material properties. Like, and, and people have been focusing on the interaction of these osmolites with the protein, but they haven't really been looking at what the heck is happening to the water structure. And so this is, we think it's an important aspect is to also see how these osmolites are affecting the water structure. And um, just wanted to acknowledge, uh, these are people in my recent group. Uh, the ones in red are people whose work I showed. Uh, the ones in parentheses are, uh, have moved on. But um, this is Chi and Jocelyn. Uh, did a lot of the work on the proteins. Ryan has done some, some of the work. Uh, he's done the sand experiments. Bailong and Chaojing have done the uh, water simulations. Um, he's my collaborators, my funding, and my um, computer resources. Thank you. For your simulations, you didn't talk too much about the computer aspects of it. Does the simulation of a large molecule like that require a supercomputer to, to do that? And yeah, so that I should say that um, most of these simulations were done on the C supercomputer, so we use the ones, um, we were using the ones in Texas, we're now using the San Diego supercomputers. We actually had uh, the past year we've been working with GPUs. Have you heard of GPUs? So, so GPUs are amazing. They were, they were actually invented for games, uh, games <laughs> graphic processor units. But it turns out that um, a lot of computation, especially simulations, work really, really well on it. And so you can get, you know, like 100 
times the speed on these things. So, yeah. Because they're venture processors. Yeah, and, and they're it, cheap, too. Yeah, yeah de facto, <laughs> you're, you're playing the game with the molecules. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like, so when I did this, when I talked to the, when I talked to <coughs> residents about, you know, I said, you know, what a computer simulation is like, it's sort of like, uh, you know, well, you know, like, they have, you know, they have these cartoons like SpongeBob or whatever, and so they, they can make SpongeBob move around. And they make, how do they make SpongeBob move around realistically? Well, they use, you know, actually force is equal to mass time. You know, Newtonian mechanics, you push things around, you want to behave reasonably. And so what we do is something like that, except rather than trying to make a sponge move around, what we try and do is we have these force constants that were based on a lot of data from molecular spectroscopy, some ab initio calculations, mature, reproducing material properties, where we refine the force constants that we use. And it, uh, most of the stuff is then Newtonian mechanics, so it's just, you know, everything is a point particle, but it's, um, I, I remember when I first gave my talk, it's, uh, talk job talk, it's an assistant professor, so somebody was a quantum mechanician says, all you do is classical mechanics. <laughs> it doesn't, it can't be right. I said, well, you know, like actually for things that are Big. bigger than, a, you know, a hydrogen, you know, when you're a hydrogen, maybe, you know, you need a little bit of quantum effects. But if you're bigger than a hydrogen, especially if you're up around body temperature, quantum effects are very small. So, you, and, and there are, the quantum effects are so much smaller than any inaccuracies you might have in your uh, force constants and things like that. So it's very simplistic. It's like, you know, like the problem you do in freshman physics of throwing a ball or something like that under the force of gravity, except the only thing that's complicated about these simulations is just that there's so many balls. And it's just that, and, and, and that's what kind of the beauty of these things is, is that you, you used to not be able to do it because you, you would go crazy, you know, adding one plus one, you know. Yeah. But computers, computers are great at that. It's, yeah. it's great use of computers. Yeah. Yes? You concentrated mostly on enzymes and uh, activity. Are protein stability for structural proteins the same? That's a good question. So you, because, Let me tell you my motivation. Okay. Is a long time ago when I was talking to the guys that did the thesis, uh, the biologist there, he had said he expected bisulfite bonds to be a lot more prevalent in proteins from the deep because that would allow for stability. But uh, I don't know whether he was guessing or he was telling me an observation. Okay. So I will tell you the first the reason why I concentrate on enzymes because there is a very easy way to tell you if it's broken. It doesn't produce the product. Sure. I mean, I, actually, it took me a little while to figure this out because I'm not a biologist, and I'm like, why are they doing all these enzymes? But that's the thing, you measure their activity. You, you float in reactant and see if it makes product. If it doesn't, it's no longer active. So there's a very oh, easy assay yeah. to say if it's working or not, and, th and that's why. And the other thing was is that we try and look at things that are um, uh, ubiquitous, and so the DHFR is found in everything from bacteria to you and you and me. So you can com do comparisons, um, that kind of thing. So if you actually, if you look at bone, uh, obviously um, cells don't have bones, and unicellular organisms. Um, I I imagine that. So this is, yeah, so, so so one of the things, at least, and I'm not sure I can generalize from bacteria, but at the, at the, at one kilobar, um, the pressure effects on these proteins in terms of making them un, Fold doesn't seem to be a huge driving force. So it's 
So it's like because the 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 pressure the the proteins from these cyprophiles at the bottom of the ocean unfold at a lower pressure than from the than the mesophiles. So it's really hard to make generalizations. And there's all but there's also the microbes um, that live near hydrothermal vents. So I think those actually are super pressure stable. I don't have a whole lot of evidence other than anecdotal evidence. But yeah. They are super hot, I miss your word. Oh, the, the ones that yeah. uh, the uh, pressure stable. Okay. So they, um, they, there was a group that was trying to make, take these um, uh, an archaebacteria from a hydrothermal, surface hydrothermal vent and he wanted to make it pressure stable. And he was, it was sort of an interesting study. He was trying to make it pressure stable at corresponding to the depth of where they think they have found water on Mars, where water might be liquid below the surface and found the pressure. But they found out, as they just took this microbe down to that pressure, and I was as happy as could be. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> these things are just thermostable, also makes you pressure stable. So, you, you know, his experiment really couldn't work. Mm -hmm. With biology. That's all. That's all for the questions. Thank you again for a great talk. And my, my videographer would like to stick slides in the